What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football, whether you're joining us from YouTube or the podcast. I appreciate your time, and I'm glad you are spending it with your mans today. I know drafts are creeping up, and we found over top of the funnel type stuff, all the early round strategy and all that kind of stuff, but as you get later into your drafts, a lot of the double digit round guys, kind of dart throws, right? And the probability of them breaking out or them actually being sleepers and are usable in fantasy football becomes slimmer and slimmer as you go down the rounds. So I thought I would remake this video for y'all, which is covering my top sleepers. Anyone going outside of the top 100 picks right now. So an ADP of 100 or later. And that is what I'm gonna consider sleepers for these videos. I'm going to do my top five wide receiver sleepers Getting picked 100 or later in fantasy football drafts currently that I think are fantastic picks in the later rounds because no matter how good you think your picks are, at that point in the draft, I can assure you the probability of you hitting on them is quite small. But I'm pretty confident with the list I've put together for you guys. I think it's gonna be a very, 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 very good video. Before we start the video, why don't you drop down below a couple guys that are getting drafted super late at the wide receiver position. Tomorrow we'll be running backs, but drop down some of your favorite sleepers getting picked outside of the top 100 currently, because I'd like to hear what y'all think. And while you're down there, I would appreciate a thumbs up if you're on the podcast, rating and review as always. But let's get cracking and right into the video. So my first guy on the list, I'm super pissed off that the news broke about Alshon Jeffrey yesterday. So I'm filming this on Wednesday. It's coming out Thursday. We heard a report that Alshon Jeffrey is going to miss the first two games, at least the first two games of the Eagles season this year. Now, I wrote this blog post like a week or two ago. So I had Nelson Aguilar on here prior to hearing the Jeffrey news. I don't know if you guys believe me or not. I don't really care, but he's still on here. Right now, he's being picked 106 overall wide receiver 43. Uh, now, Aguilar, hopefully you guys can still see it. I mean, Aguilar is easily my favorite pick outside of the top 100 guys. And I would actually be perfectly fine taking him as early as like the seventh or eighth round if, if you're looking for a wide receiver in that range. Now, Aguilar legitimately balled out last year for the first time. He was a stud when he came out of college uh, at USC. The Eagles invested a first round pick into him. He went 20th overall in the 20, I think it was a 20, 2014 draft because he's been in the league for three years now. They completely miscast him and misused him over the first two years of his career. And that's why you saw such terrible numbers come from Aguilar and why people assumed he was uh, immediately a bust. Then they switched things up. During the first two years, Aguilar ran 80% of his routes on the outside as an outside receiver. And that's how he operated. Last year, they switched things up and he ran from the slot. He operated as the Eagles primary slot receiver on 80% of his routes. So he went from an 80% outside route runner to an 80% slot guy. That is a huge difference. People need to understand that the NFL is moving more towards slot guys and these are the guys that are producing heavily. And even when teams are putting their studs, guys like Michael Thomas produces heavily from the slot. Um, Julio Jones, his numbers are great when he's from the slot because you don't have to get off of man or press coverage, right? You don't have to be a perfect route technician like a Stefan Diggs or an Antonio Brown in order to be successful on the outside. When you're in the slot, people are playing off you. All you have to do is find the zones. And that's what they did for Nelson Aguilar. And that's when he really saw uh, things turn around last year for him. He ended up with a career high in just about every statistical category. 62 catches, 768 yards, eight touchdowns. He would finish the year as wide receiver 22 in half point PPR for fantasy purposes. That was one spot ahead of Alshon Jeffrey, who finished as wide receiver 23. They both played in 16 games. Jeffrey saw 25 more targets than Aguilar did. Aguilar still finished a spot above him in fantasy rankings. Now, what I love about Aguilar is not only is he locked in as the wide receiver two here, right? When Jeffrey's healthy, Aguilar is a wide receiver two. But Jeffrey is returning from this rotator cuff surgery, off-season surgery, and now he's missing the first two games of the season. We don't know if it, he hasn't been cleared off the pup yet. So we actually don't know what the severity of his length is. I believe the return timetable is projected to be uh, week three. And that's when they want him to come back. However, the thing with people coming back early into the season or even midway through the season is this. It's like he misses the first two games. The third game, he'll probably be on like a limited snap count to see how he does. Then if you're owning him on your fantasy team, you want to see him have a full game, right? You want to see him run a full game of snaps with production before you're comfortable putting him back into the lineup. And that's the scary part about a guy like Alshon Jeffrey. 
is not only is he going to miss the two games, but you're probably not comfortable starting him in your lineup until a few weeks after he actually returns. So now with Jeffrey out, this is a prime opportunity for Aguilar to just dominate targets. Now, I expect them to run a lot more two tight end sets uh, with Trey Burton. I mean, not Trey Burton. I'm sorry. Uh, Zach Ertz. Trey Burton was their tight end last year. Zach Ertz and uh, Dallas Godart. Aguilar should still be operating as a slot receiver. I believe they will find other... I, I know they, they understood what they had in Aguilar once they moved him to the slot, and I don't think that's going to change anything. I don't think they're going to move him outside just because Jeffrey's out, but that makes the, uh, the quarterback in Nick Foles, who I'm assuming is going to be the quarterback because Carson Wentz hasn't been um, clear for contact yet, and they're naming a starting quarterback on Friday because they actually play the Thursday night football game, so he's got a few days less to recover than everyone else. Either way, it's going to be more comfortable with the quarterback for Aguilar than these other outside wide receivers, whoever they end up throwing in there. So I see with Jeffrey out, Aguilar's upside gets a little bigger. I think his floor is great as the number two receiver in this in this high-powered offense, but with Jeffrey out, you know, I only think that helps raise his targets. And speaking about the quarterback, right? I would much rather have Wentz as the quarterback under center, of course, if I am an Aguilar owner. If I'm, if you know, if I'm the owner of anyone in this Eagles offense from a fantasy perspective. But I found something interesting. I went back and looked at the splits last year. Aguilar actually averaged 4.3 receptions versus 3.5 receptions with Nick Foles under center as opposed to Carson Wentz. He saw 6.15 targets versus 5.8 targets when Nick Foles was in the lineup. So he was actually utilized more heavily with. Nick Foles in the lineup then without Nick Foles there. So even if Carson Wentz misses some time, uh, the splits don't look bad for Aguilar. He is still comfortable throwing to Aguilar and using him as a vital piece of this offense. He had less than 100 targets last year, but like I was saying, uh, on pace with Nick Foles, it was 6.15 targets a game. You pace that out to a uh, 16-game season, you're getting just about 100 targets. So I think it was like 98.7 or something like that. So if, if we're pacing him out to 100 targets, which I think is reasonable, if Jeffrey misses time, I think you're going to see that target number that target total, another year more comfortable in this offense as a slot receiver. Jeffrey missing time. I could easily see Aguilar getting upwards of 110 targets, maybe 120 targets if things break right. So you're getting someone who's going to get volume, who has a nice floor. Uh, and I think he's an incredible value at pick 106. Looking at last year too, um, per player profiler, Aguilar's production, <coughs> production premium ranked 17th among NFL wide receivers last year. His target premium ranked 7th among all NFL wide receivers. He had the 10th highest QB rating when targeted among all WRs and ranked 10th in the NFL in fantasy points per target. Now, I'm not going to sit here and say all those are like predictive statistics or, you know, that makes him such a great wide receiver or anything, but the point is Aguilar is going to be a key piece of a very good offense. And we're looking at his red zone uses, right? And that's something that kept him afloat because he scored eight touchdowns last year. He had 18 red zone targets last year, which was 11th among NFL wide receivers. He had nine 10 zone targets, which was ninth among NFL wide receivers. So almost top 10 in both red zone and 10 zone targets among wide receivers. Now, even if you think those eight touchdowns are gonna regress, but by the look of it, the way they're using him in this offense and how heavily involved he is in the red zone, I don't really see that being the case. Um, I still think he's finishing with a floor of six or seven touchdowns. I think we're going to see that number repeat for Aguilar. And looking back last year, I know like this is maybe a little bit of a reach, but there wasn't a single wide receiver in the NFL that finished with seven or more receiving touchdowns and finished outside of the top 40 fantasy wide receivers. If Aguilar can, if you think Aguilar is going to score seven touchdowns this year, he won't finish outside of the top 40 fantasy wide receivers. He probably won't finish outside of the top 30, but he's currently being picked at wide receiver 43. If Jeffrey misses time, man, Aguilar could be one of the steals of your draft. Um, and I still think he's a consistent wide receiver three, even if Jeffrey is out there, um, because I think he's gonna start slow. So Aguilar is my number one. We move on to number two, Kenny Galladay of the Detroit Lions. Y'all should be very, very aware of Kenny Smooth by this point. If you're not, here is his makeup. He is a monster. Six foot four, 218 pounds, runs a 4.540 at that size, puts him in the 92nd percentile of speed score, huge catch radius and 84th percentile spark score, all the good stuff, all the good stuff. He was the Lions second round pick last season. Um, and he was absolutely as advertised once he was on the field and once he was given the chance. The concern here is just that, will he be on the field enough? Will he actually get that chance? Nothing about the situation. I'm really hoping that we don't just hype up Kenny Galladay every off season, hoping that he finally wins the job because there's been nothing that has said Marvin Jones or Golden Tate will be um, missing time or losing snaps to Kenny Galladay. Yeah, this last preseason game, Galladay did end up with the most targets on the team. 
Uh, but the snap counts are still all in favor of Marvin Jones and Golden Tate, so I wouldn't look too much into the box score in these preseason games. So nothing tells me that Marvin Jones and Golden Tate are on their way out and Kenny Galladay is taking away playing time for them. But at the same time, surprising things happen in fantasy football every single year. And I think Galladay breaking the fuck out would probably be the least surprising, surprising aspect of this fantasy football season if it were to happen. Now, Kenny Galladay dealt with a hamstring injury uh, last year that missed him, that forced him to miss five games, right, during his rookie year. Uh, but he averaged a sexy 17 yards per reception on 28 catches as a rookie. So he was a playmaker. He was explosive when he was in the game. And as I was saying, in their final preseason game, Galladay out-targeted all of Stafford's weapons. Uh, he had five targets. He caught only one of those five, but it was for 36 yards, which is, again, exemplifying his big play ability. But the usage is encour encouraging. You know, Stafford is clearly trusting Galladay here. However, I know there's rumors of Galladay starting over Golden Tate in these two wide receiver sets. That went back to the norm. It was Tate and Marvin Jones starting in two wide receiver sets in this last preseason game. In their third preseason game, in terms of snaps, Stafford played 36, so we're looking at 36 starter snaps. Jones played 33 of them. Golden Tate played 32. Kenny G played 26. So he was the third in the pecking order in terms of playing time and being on the field. And guys, in terms of those rumors of Kenny Galladay starting in two wide receiver sets, the Lions have run three wide receiver sets more frequently than any NFL team over the last two seasons. Uh, I think it was like 85% of their plays are three wide receiver sets. So even, and I don't think this is going to be true, I'm pretty sure it's going to be Golden Tate, Marvin Jones, even if it was Kenny Galladay out there, two wide receiver sets, it's not like Tate is not going to be, he's basically a full-time player either way. Now, I mean, after, he, he split snaps with TJ Jones last year. He dealt with the, the hammy injury. I think Kenny G is going to be a lot more involved in the offense. He should be a lot more productive. And he's set up to be nearly a full-time wide receiver. He'll probably play around 65, 70-ish percent of the snaps on this offense. And given Galladay's upside, his talent, and what we think he can be, um, that should be enough to, you know, for you to be able to pick him with confidence. And hopefully maybe during bye weeks, by that time, his usage has been up a little bit. And Galladay's more of an upside play. I do think that he is probably the least likely on this list to be able to break through the players that are in front of him on the depth chart. But if something were to happen to one of those two wide receivers, Galladay should be in for a monster season. So Galladay is number two. We had Nelson Aguilar, Kenny Galladay. Number three is Anthony Miller of the Chicago Bears, currently being picked 160 overall wide receiver 60. Guys, if you have been following me at all this summer, you know that Anthony Miller is like, he's like quickly became probably like my favorite player in the NFL. Uh, I've done a ton of research. I've watched so much game film. I've done a lot of statistical analysis on Anthony Miller. And you could find, like if you have my draft guide, obviously you can look into a lot of the stuff I said about Miller. I talked about him in my rookies video, my breakout video, my a million different videos I've talked about Anthony Miller in. So I'm not gonna go into too deep of depth here. Uh, end of story is that I believe Anthony Miller is going to be an absolute stud. I think he's going to explode in this league and people, compare Antonio Brown to Anthony Miller or vice versa, whatever. I think if there's anyone coming out besides OBJ over the next few years that can be the Antonio Brown, it's Anthony Miller. He is so strong in catching the ball. He makes ridiculous plays. He is such a good route runner. He has a knack for the end zone. He does all these things. The Bears traded up for him to grab him in the second round. I think it's a perfect pairing with Mitch Trubisky, who is much more successful throwing the ball over the middle than he is throwing the ball on the outside of the field outside of the numbers, and we've seen that all the way dating back to college where Trubisky loves to throw to his slot guys. And uh, Chris Godwin, I mean, uh, Anthony Miller, sorry for the foreshadowing, but Anthony Miller is going to be the starting slot receiver there, and I wouldn't be surprised if he ended up starting in two wide receiver sets over Taylor Gabriel within the first month of the season. But going back to Mitch Trubisky, you look at his days, his, his one you know breakout year at UNC, Ryan Switzer was his main target there. He caught like 95 passes for over 1,100 or 1,200 yards. He loved throwing the ball over the middle to his slot guy. Last year, Kendall Wright was his number one receiver in this offense. I just think things are set up for Anthony Miller. He has the opportunity here. He's going to be on the field for many, 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 many of their snaps and their plays, and his talent is undeniable if you watch him play. So Miller's a guy I am so, so high on, and I'm trying to get him later in uh, almost all of my drafts. So if you're looking for a guy in the third to last, second to last, whatever round, to add wide receiver depth to your team, look no further than Anthony Miller of the Chicago Bears. I'm telling you, you just watch like 
You don't even have to watch his highlights. Go to playerprofiler.com, type in Anthony Miller, go down to the bottom, they'll have a video of just his game film from one game, and you can't not watch that and be like, holy Miller. It's, it's absolutely Miller time. So that's number three. We have Anthony Miller, and I was talking about how in my draft guide, I have him as one of my top sleepers. If you have not yet purchased the draft guide, we are creeping up on 500 copies sold, guys. I cannot give a big enough thank you to anyone who has uh, believed in me and supported me and purchased the draft guide. That is amazing. For those of you guys who are seeing me for the first time, uh, I appreciate you joining me, as I said before. Make sure you hit that subscribe button down below because we'll be doing videos like this throughout the rest of the summer and into the season, of course, trying to figure out what my in-season schedule is gonna be like. But the draft guide has all my top sleepers, my top busts, my must draft players. It has all of my rankings, all of my positional rankings by tiers, my dynasty rookie rankings, all of these things in there, plus so much more, my top resources for um, fantasy football research and information and all that stuff. It's completely mobile. You can get it on your laptop, on your phone, on your tablet. If you do order it, guys, it comes delivered in uh, an email instructions on how to access it a few minutes after you make the purchase guys so just give it uh, a few minutes once you make the purchase and it might end up in your spam folder because google's always trying to hold your mans down support small business here guys that's what i'm asking for you to do uh, i promise it's like the one-stop shop it's all you really need for your fantasy football draft in 2018 it's got everything covered in there so please cop that it will be linked down below bigdogsfantasy.com head over to the shop section and you will find it let's move on to Wide receiver sleeper number four, as I mentioned before. Chris Godwin of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. He is going super late in drafts, uh, but the hype train is rising quickly. Godwin's a guy I loved before the summer even started. He's someone that if you check out my Instagram page, BDGE underscore fantasy football, I've talked about him um, all the way back in, I think it was like May, April, things like that. He, he is a, a legitimate stud, and I think he's going to be a superstar in this league. And he's done nothing this summer to quiet my excitement uh, about him. So we look at what happened in the preseason games, right? Is he going to get more usage? Just like Galladay, the problem is they already have wide receivers there in Mike Evans, in Deshaun Jackson. They already have weapons in O.J. Howard, Cameron Bray, whatever, right? Godwin, as per usual, made the most on limited time uh, in the preseason. He secured seven of eight targets for 55 yards, and he's led the wide receiver group with two touchdowns. Should have had a third, but it was called back on a penalty. Um, so he should have had three touchdowns in the preseason in three games. He's been connecting with Jameis Winston. He scored a touchdown over the all-pro cornerback Darius Slay. I'm telling you, this guy is absolutely legit. He is a 22-year-old, third-round pick out of Penn State, and I really want the Bucks to give him a full-time role. And they've been talking about it basically all, all summer, all training camp, all preseason. Everyone from the GM to the offensive coordinator, to beat reporters, have raved about Chris Godwin, about him making plays all summer. He's earned the right for a bigger role. He's earned the right to start. A clear standout in spring camp makes lots of plays every single day. Nothing bad out of the Chris Godwin side. And just to kind of touch more on uh, his college production, right? He was a receiver out of Penn State, and we've seen guys like Allen Robinson come out that are super athletic, super long, and able to pinpoint balls in the air. That's sem that's semi like Chris Godwin. I think he's got a great all-around game, though. He's someone who ranks super, super highly in terms of contested catches. I think his contested catch rate was like 81% coming out of school. It was one of the highest percentages per Matt Harmon's uh, reception perception. He runs good routes. Like I said, he jumps very, very high. He can pinpoint the ball. It's almost like having another Mike Evans on the other side. Back at Penn State, he racked up over 2,100 receiving yards in his last two years. 16 touchdowns, averaged over 16 yards per reception. And then he exploded at the combine as one of the top tier athletes. He ran a 4-4-2 40-yard dash. Given his size, that's very, very, very impressive. He is 6-1-2-10. 4-4-2 40-yard dash, 6-1-2-10. That puts him in the 89th percentile. For weight adjusted speed score, he would end up being in the 95th percentile as a spark athlete, which was top of his class. And he was just 21 years old last year, guys, as a rookie. Still very raw, and he still has to earn time behind Mike Evans and Deshaun Jackson. But their coaching staff clearly is telling you, they're literally like he's earned the right to start. But like I said, he makes the most of the time that he's had on the field. He had 54 targets last year. He turned 54 targets into 525 receiving yards. So he's carrying over that playmaking ability from college to the NFL. His 15.4 yards per reception ranked 13th in the NFL. His 9.7 yards per target ranked 7th in the NFL. That beats 
every Buccaneer wide receiver in those categories, as well as the highest yak, the highest yards after catch. So he's not only a baller, he's not only being productive in limited sample size, he can also move with the ball in his hands. What stood out more to me, well, actually on that point too, is like, you know, you like a lot of guys coming out of college. This is a guy that many people did like coming out of college, but they fail to produce. A lot of them get limited sample size in their rookie year, right? And they fail to produce. So people like to chalk that up as like, oh, he needs more opportunity, he needs more opportunity. Chris Godwin got the limited opportunity that a lot of rookie wide receivers do, but he turned it into a lot of production, right? 54 targets, 525 receiving yards. That is really, really good. So if you're getting 100, 100 targets, basically on this pace, you're going over 1,000 receiving yards. So all he really needs is the opportunity to turn it into production, man. And I, and I really hope Godwin gets it this year. What stood out more to me, his ability to be the guy when, um, when Mike Evans or Deshaun Jackson missed time last year. And there were a few games when that happened. So Mike Evans missed week 10. That's when Godwin, G-A-W-D, assumed the, the wide receiver one role there. He caught five of 10 targets for 68 yards. That's not monster production, but you're seeing that he was force fed targets, right? He was the number one option in that offense, 10 targets. Now, Deshaun Jackson missed weeks 16 and 17, and he was even better. He closed the season with a line of three for 98, and the last game of the season, seven catches, 111 yards, and a touchdown to close the year. So it tells me that like, when given the opportunity, man, he has not failed to impress and not failed to assume the role of a legitimate, good NFL wide receiver. Last year, he played in just 41% of the team's snaps in 2017, but that's gonna grow. And you're looking at the preseason so far, Right? While Djax is still going to be a part of this offense and he's still going to um, play and, and have his share of snaps, Godwin has played in 43 of 70 first string snaps, which is 61.4% up from, like I said, 41%. That's a 20% increase in the amount of snaps he's been playing with the first team and with the starters. And if he can be at 61% for the year, you're going to look at some pretty good production for a guy that you can get in one of the last rounds of your draft. And from John Paulson over at 4 for 4 Fantasy Football, this is a quote from him. In the five games where Chris Godwin has played at least 50% of the snaps, he has averaged 4.2 catches, 73 yards, and 0.2 touchdowns on 7.2 targets per game, guys. 50% of the snaps, he's averaging 7.2 targets. Now, I can't do the math, but if you pace that out to 16 games, that's, I think, 112 targets, right? If I'm doing that, yeah. So 112 targets in games that he's playing 50% of the snaps, which is what I expect. So like I said, Djax won't be phased out of the offense completely, but his time is coming. And if Godwin you know, starts seeing more and more snaps throughout the season, he's someone to absolutely keep an eye on as the season progresses, because he could be a late breakout candidate, guys. Chris Godwin's a guy I love grabbing at the end of the drafts. And my numero five. Before we get to number five, though, I want to thank today's sponsors for the video fantasyjocks.com. You already know that. If you're drafting this weekend, make sure you get on there and get your live draft board. You can get it expedited shipping, but they are the industry leader in terms of gear for your fantasy football league or fantasy baseball, basketball, whatever league you play in. They got all the sports covered. They got championship belts. They got championship rings. They got trophies, nice Lombardi trophies. You can get the teams, the championship team's name engraved on the side of the belt on the bottom of the trophy. I'm telling you, is really, 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 really cool. It makes your league that much better just playing for something like this. You might think it's ridiculous and childish, but I'm telling you, once something like this is on the line, you want it bad. It's like better than winning the money that your league's buy-in is. So if you guys buy in for like 50 bucks a pop, have everyone throw in 60 bucks or 62 bucks or something, grab yourself a belt, grab yourself a trophy, whatever it is. I think the trophies start at like 30 bucks, rings are like 30. The belts are a little more expensive, but if you're breaking it down between 20, 10, 12 people, it's not too bad. You could use promo code TAKE10 or TACO CORP, T-A-C-O-C-O-R-P for 10% off. The link to Fantasy Jocks will be list, listed down below. So make sure you check out fantasyjocks.com. Thank you for sponsoring today's video. Love y'all as always. Good people, man. Good customer service. They're just good dudes over there. Good quality, quality, high quality product. Couldn't recommend them more, guys. And I'm not just plugging them because they're sponsoring the video. I've been using their stuff for the last four or five years in all of my leagues. So go check them out, fantasyjocks.com. Numero five. Whew. I gotta stop drinking so much damn caffeine. And y'all, while we're just throwing plugs in here, I would very much appreciate if you guys dropped a thumbs up down below if you're getting some value from this video. As I always say, I work very hard on these. I put a lot of time and energy into them. So if you're enjoying it and you think they're helping you out, man, uh, just a thumbs up or a comment down below would mean a lot to me because I'm competing with these bigger brands now. They understand that YouTube is the GOAT something I've seen like years ago, but 
now they're coming around to it and uh, I'm competing with the big names. So any thumbs up or comment really helps helps your boy out. So go do that, please. And we'll move on to numero five. Another wide receiver like Nelson Aguilar, who I was really excited about prior to an injury to his teammate. This is Keelan Cole of the Jacksonville Jaguars. Currently undrafted, pretty much. He won't be for long, but he will still be technically outside of the top 100, I think, in almost every draft this upcoming weekend. Aguilar will probably creep up into like the seventh or eighth round with the Jeffrey News, but Cole will still be a late round pick that I think you guys should all snag. So following the knee injury to Marcus Lee, which left him on the IR and he's going to be out for the year, Keelan Cole becomes the Jags wide receiver to own, guys. It ain't Didi. It ain't Dante Moncrief. It definitely ain't DJ Chark. It is Keelan Cole, and it's about to be a, a hashtag Cole world. I hate J. Cole, so Keelan Cole is the only Cole we acknowledge in the HQ. That's all I wanted to say. Now, we will uh, we'll get into some breakdown on Keelan Cole. Uh, to introduce you to Keelan Cole, he is 25-year-old undrafted free agent out of, just wait on it, Kentucky Wesleyan. I hope I'm plan saying that right. Does anyone go to Kentucky Wesleyan that watches these videos? If you do, I would love to know how to pronounce that. Kentucky, Kentucky Wesleyan. Wesleyan, Wesleyan. I don't know, but that's where Keelan Cole's from. And he was running as the opposite starting wide receiver of Marquise Lee prior to the injury. So Lee was set up to be their wide receiver one. Obviously, he got paid this offseason, so he was running accordingly. Keelan Cole eventually worked his way up to be the wide receiver two there and was playing the majority of the snaps prior to Lee's injury. Now he automatically, by default, climbs up to be the wide receiver one in this offense. And that's uh, a spot that I was pretty sure he was going to claim regardless of Lee's injury or not. I think Lee is kind of just a guy. And I think in such a crowded receiving core, uh, talent will win out because most guys will get opportunity and they will make the most of it once it's that uh, once it's that crowded. And I think Cole was going to be the guy to do that. But now we'll get to know for sure. Um, this is a quote from fantasyguru.com. I think it was from Graham Barfield. The Jags' first team offense has run 53 pass plays over their last two preseason games. And I say the last two because Cole sat out for the first game. So just to get an idea, while all the wide receivers were healthy, over their last two preseason games versus Minnesota and Atlanta, their first string wide receiver snaps on pass plays over these two games were Keelan Cole, 42 of 53. Well, Keelan Cole, 79%. Dante Moncrief, 58%. D.D. Westbrook, 49%. D.J. Chark, 26%. So Cole was an 80% snap guy on pass plays for the Jags during these actual games uh, with the starters. So Keelan Cole was already the guy there. The next closest guy was Moncrief at 58%. Keelan Cole was just under 80%. So that tells you where he was already running prior to the injury. So this is this is kind of a combination of me hyping up Cole's talent. I think he's a very talented player, but now he's getting the opportunity where you have guys on this list like Godwin and Galladay, whose talent is undeniable, and they probably have higher ceilings than guys like Cole or Nelson Aguilar, but they don't have the opportunity. In redraft, you gotta chase volume and you gotta chase opportunity. Um, and, you know, in Dynasty, obviously, the efficiency usually will end up leading to opportunity. But for just 2018, I absolutely love Cole as a wide receiver one here. Looking back to last year, he caught a total of eight passes. So despite catching only eight passes from weeks one to eight in 2017, Cole ended up leading the entire Jaguars team with 748 receiving yards. And he tied Marquise Lee with three scoring touchdowns. Now, obviously, that's not encouraging to only score three touchdowns, but it led the team tied for the lead so it's not like anyone else is doing anything crazy there he saw more than 60 percent of the team snaps in just two of their first nine weeks once they once they let the young god wild that's exactly what he did he went he went wild from weeks 9 to 16 last year from weeks 9 to 16 i want y'all to hear this cole was fantasy's wide receiver 10 in standard leagues weeks 9 to 16 is a big sample size he was wide receiver 10 in standard leagues, wide receiver 14 in PPR leagues. He led the NFL during that span, racking up 20.1 yards per reception among all NFL wideouts with 45 targets or more in 2017. Keelan Cole finished ranking second in yards per, tar uh, yards per reception, 17.8, sixth in yards per target, and fourth in yards after catch. The yak. 6.8 yards after catch over the last five weeks of the season. So we have a pretty big sample size, but let's break it down further. How did he end the year? What can we look forward to in 2018? Over the last five weeks of the season, the only fantasy wide receivers that outperformed Cole by way of fantasy points were Keenan Allen, DeAndre Hopkins, Julio Jones, and Tyreek Hill. 
He threw up three monster games to finish the year. Weeks 14, three for 99 and a touchdown. Weeks 15, seven for 186 and a touchdown. I don't know if y'all remember that. He put up 186 in a game. In week 16, six for 108. Fool me once, y'all know the saying. According to Pro Football Focus's Josh Norris, well, not according to, but this was his comparison. He, he compared Keelan Cole to Marvin Jones, and I actually think that is a spot-on comparison. They're both pretty long, they're both lanky, uh, but they're both strong, and they're both able to get up in the air. They're both around 6'1", 195, 200 pounds. Great outside threats, great at getting down the field, great at pinpointing the ball in the air and grabbing it away from defenders at its peak. So, ironically, Jones was the only player in the NFL last year to have a higher yards per reception than Keelan Cole. So I think that comparison is well warranted. And now Keelan Cole is stepping into the wide receiver one role. I know a lot of people are high on Blake Bortles because they think no one's going to be passing the ball in this offense. And the reason I wasn't high on Marquise Lee wasn't because that wasn't my argument like, oh, the Jags aren't going to throw the ball at all. But when it's so crowded, you don't know who's going to get that ball. And I didn't think Marquise Lee was that talented. But now I do think Keelan Cole is that talented. And I think that the fact that he is the wide receiver one here now gives him the opportunity to showcase that talent. I think before long, Keelan Cole is going to be one of the top waiver wire ads probably within the first couple weeks. So I would just suggest drafting him in one of the later rounds of your draft. In uh, the two redrafts I've done so far, I have Cole in both of those leagues, and I'm hoping to get him the tail end of uh, all the other redrafts that I have within the next week or so. So grab Cole. I'm telling y'all, I think, you know, usually I'll finish a, a video and I'll be like, uh, you know, there, you know, I, I like what I said, but there's a good chance that I miss on a few of the things I said. But I feel really, really strongly about this list, guys. Nelson Aguilar, Kenny Galladay, Anthony Miller, Chris Godwin, Keelan Cole. And I think we're going to look back in 2018 or once it's 2019, you look back and I'm going to look at this list and be like, God damn, Nick, you was cream, baby. Cash rules everything around me for you young guns who don't even know who Wu Tang probably is at this point. But this is a good list, guys. If you're looking for later round wide receivers, just go off this list. Get Chris Godwin, get Keelan Cole, get Anthony Miller, get Galladay, get Aguilar, who probably won't be outside of the top 100 picks now, but y'all know what I'm saying. So that will wrap up my top five wide receiver sleepers. Tomorrow will be my running back sleepers, ADP 100 plus. If you enjoyed the video, again, guys, please give me that thumbs up button. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you are new. Leave a comment down below, all that kind of yada, yada, yada. The draft guide is also linked down below, and I'll see y'all tomorrow. Peace.